It's International Human Solidarity Day. Established by the United Nations and its member states, the day serves as an opportunity to celebrate unity in diversity, but also to raise awareness about the importance of coming together for a common cause. These are certainly sentiments we hope to carry throughout this holiday period and beyond. Another tip for this holiday season? You have large amounts of food laid out for a couple of hours or more, and the family keeps coming back, dipping, visitors come and dipping. You have to ensure if you have the food out for more than two hours, hot food, be very careful, especially if you add sauces and, and other, uh, other condiments on the food. It tends to go a little off early. This and more coming up in today's magazine program, but not before the news. Good day, I'm Stephen McHugh, and this is your JIS News for Tuesday, December 20, 2022. Prime Minister Andrew Holness has sounded the warning that the security apparatus will be going full force against criminal elements seeking to cause mayhem during the holidays. According to Mr. Holness, intelligence is showing that, coming closer to Christmas, organized criminal gangs operating right across Jamaica are engaged in increasing acts of robberies, extortion, housebreaking, and other crimes. I want to make it clear to the criminals yes, that we are going to be going full force against them. And I want to give the law-abiding, peaceful citizens the assurance that we are going to keep you safe and secure, particularly in this Christmas season. The Prime Minister made the declaration last Friday in Manchester while handing over a NSHP home to a mother of five in the Knockpatrick community. He also announced that when the current states of emergency come to an end in a few days, the government will seriously and carefully consider the application of a new SOE. To ensure that we can save more lives. We want to see you in 2023. So we are going to do everything possible to ensure that. Minister of Transport and Mining Audley Shaw says the new departures retail area at Sangster International Airport is yet another example of the resilience of Jamaica's aeronautical sector, especially coming out of the height of the COVID-19 pandemic. During the recent grand opening of the facility, Minister Shaw said the new facility would add significantly to the airport's revenue generation. With the official opening of the departure retail area, this airport is expected to see substantial growth in non-aeronautical revenue contributed by these retail shops that have chosen to partner with one of the leading airports in the region. He says the departures retail area, which includes a food court, is a welcomed addition to the passenger experience that further supports the rebound of air travel. Airport business development is at a pivotal point where persons no longer come only to get from one destination to another, but can enjoy a different shopping experience. This new addition brings the Sangster International Airport into a whole new league, and I'm excited to see the direction we are heading. The Rural Agricultural Development Authority, RADA, is now positioned to offer improved extension services to farmers in Hanover after receiving a new state-of-the-art parish office. The RADA office in Lucy was opened last Wednesday, replacing the old dilapidated building that was demolished in 2017. The space was constructed at a cost of $110 million and will serve more than 7,000 registered farmers in the parish. Minister of Agriculture and Fisheries, Pernell Charles Jr., says the new office will provide the RADA staff members with a more comfortable workspace and better allow them to offer the kind of service farmers deserve. So I want to encourage you to use these additional resources to propel yourselves. Come 2023, we want Hanover to move up in the numbers in terms of domestic production. The Ministry of Health and Wellness has announced a new national campaign to increase immunization coverage in Jamaica. 
Portfolio Minister Dr. Christopher Tufton announced the initiative called Mop Up Catch Up during his ministry's recent end of year press conference. He says details will be provided shortly. Jamaica has enjoyed a robust history of successful inoculation, which has eliminated several diseases such as poliomyelitis, measles and rubella. But Minister Tufton asserts that coverage is still not at the desired levels. We have achieved significant uh, in terms of immunization against these things, yellow fever and so on. And uh, it is important that we get back there. I mean, we have 95% coverage for all recommended childhood vaccines, but there was a time when we were higher. We were probably 99%. Um, and so even a, a slight fall in that is, is concerning. Immunization has become a point of criticism sufficient to discourage uh, some persons from taking advantage of this very important life-saving and human development practice. Stressing that vaccination works, he says the government has ensured that only safe vaccines enter the island. It goes through a lot of technical examination. They work and they have worked in Jamaica for many years. One of the reasons why our life expectancy is so high 70 odd percent, um, 76 I think for women and 74 for men on average is because our human development index is largely linked to the health response where immunization from a toddler until adulthood has given significant protection to the population. By law, children in Jamaica must be vaccinated against the following preventable diseases smallpox, pertussis or whooping cough, polio, tetanus, diphtheria, measles, mumps, rubella and congenital rubella syndrome, haemophilus influenza type B, hepatitis B and tuberculosis. The Mop Up Catch Up campaign will encourage parents and guardians to ensure their children are immunized at the appropriate age levels. And finally, 16 young people representing primary, secondary and tertiary schools across the island have received prizes for their submissions to the JIS's 2022 Heritage Competition. The award ceremony was held recently at the Terra Nova All Suite Hotel in St. Andrew. The students were awarded for their outstanding essays, posters, graphics and photographic entries highlighting the country's most significant post-independence achievement. Shadir Green of Chetwood Memorial Primary School won for the best essay. Cornwall College put forward both the top graphic submission from Genovi Gale and the grade 7 to 9 poster by DeAndre Granston. The grades 10 to 13 poster award went to John Michael Ramsey of Herbert Morrison Technical High School. University of the West Indies Mona student Rochiel Powell is this year's photography winner. They were presented with trophies, cash, vacations, gift baskets, brunch tickets, plaques, free courses and certificates among other prizes. Minister with Responsibility for Information Robert Morgan congratulated the finalists and commended the JIS for creating a space where young people can express themselves through their artistic talents. A lot of the most revolutionary ideas that we need as a society to evolve and build out into a modern society that we can all be proud of can, should and needs to come from young people. It is for this reason that I believe that JIS has a role in the society of creating an environment where we empower people to critically analyze information to come to their own conclusions. The JIS Heritage Competition was established in 2011 as a platform for young people to voice their opinions on issues of national importance and widen their knowledge about the country's heritage. And that's it for JIS News Today. I'm Stephen McHugh. Thanks for watching. Up next, the latest coming out of the office of the Prime Minister. Coming up, Prime Minister launches NIDS technical pilot, delivers more homes on the new social housing program, and fets seniors at annual OPM Yuletide treat. That and more inside today's edition of Jamaica House Weekly. I'm Vanessa Silvera.
First up. We are this close, this close to rolling out nationally across Jamaica. Prime Minister Andrew Holness at the launch of the technical pilot for the National Identification System NIDS at the Jamaica Post Central Sorting Office in Kingston on Tuesday. The pilot brings government closer to the full rollout of a secure way of verifying an individual's identity. Mr. Holness also opened the Card Personalization Center at the same location. This is where we will have the technical pilot rollout after which we will commence a national rollout all across Jamaica. This technical pilot phase of the program will involve a select number of Jamaicans going through the enrollment process over the next three months. While reiterating that NIDS is a voluntary enrollment system, Mr. Holness stressed that a framework has been put in place to protect the data collected under the system. We have embedded into law serious consequences for data breaches. Most importantly, however, the NIDS is subject to the Data Protection Act. While at the launch, the Prime Minister also announced that the government would be moving to obtain International Civil Aviation Organization ICAO certification for the new NIDS card. On Tuesday, Several families in various St. Andrew communities were given the keys to their new homes in time for Christmas. The presentations were done under the government's new social housing program, the NSHP. They include a one-bedroom unit gifted to Rayanne Moore in the Rock Hall community of West Rural St. Andrew. Over in Golden Hill, a mother of four expressed gratitude for her two-bedroom house. Two three-bedroom units were also delivered to two families in the Callaloo Muse and Andrews Penn communities. And Kintyre Close resident Sylvia Green became the first recipient of one of the precast solutions being developed as government explores new construction innovations to bring down the cost and delivery time of the NSHB units. It is uh, much easier to build that uh, in terms of the walls being precast and then assembled. Uh, it, it uses uh, less labor and less cost, but it delivers uh, quickly and gives you uh, equal, if not better strength than uh, a block and steel solution. The unit was constructed in about 28 days on-site, with seven days off-site work taking place concurrently. So this is just one example of the innovations that we're doing. We need to be able to scale up to do thousands of houses if we're going to truly tackle the housing um, crisis that we have, particularly for indigent, for persons who are unemployed. Uh, if we're really going to make an impact with social housing, we need to be doing it at scale. On Wednesday, the Prime Minister handed over another NSHP unit, this one constructed in partnership with private sector company Arc Properties. The two-bedroom precast dwelling was presented to West Central St. Andrew resident Sidoni Eldemar. First and foremost, I want to give the Prime Minister really appreciate this. It it has been a rough, 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 rough year. But as the songwriter said, when God said yes, no man says no. Thank you so much. May God continue to bless your own work and pushing more help for people like me to benefit a house like that. While lauding ARC properties for being the first private sector entity to join the government's initiative, the Prime Minister again appealed for others to come on board. The government that I lead puts in place all the necessary mechanisms for accountability and transparency in these infrastructure projects. So for the private sector persons looking on who we are appealing to, who may have certain skepticisms, about the processes. The only skepticism that you should have is that the project might take a little longer than you expect because of the rigor that we apply to accountability and transparency. 
On Friday, the Prime Minister travelled to Manchester to deliver five more social housing units in Lancaster, Knockpatrick, New Hall, Freetown and Comfort Hall. Finally, on Wednesday, the Prime Minister hosted his annual end-of-year senior street at his office in St. Andrew. He led the distribution of gifts, personal care items, and food packages in what was the first face-to-face -face senior street being held at his office since the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic. While delivering greetings, he said his administration was cognizant of the unique needs of this group and pledged more assistance in the coming months. Conditions under which many of you live presently is not the best. And it is something that is always on my mind. And as we seek to improve the economy, improve our infrastructure, we must also improve the services and facilities we have for our seniors and our vulnerable, our shut-ins and our indigents. 218 Golden Ages were feted at the December 14 event. They were drawn from the Golden Age home, Marie Atkins Night Shelter, Desmond McKenzie Transitional Center, and the George Abrams home in the corporate area. He also held another treat on Sunday, this time for children. And that's it for Jamaica House Weekly. Be sure to join us next time for more of the news stories coming out of the Office of the Prime Minister. I'm Vanessa Silvera. Do not leave valuables such as gifts, laptops, and cell phones in plain view in your car. If you have to leave these items in the vehicle, put them in the trunk. This will decrease the likelihood of a car break-in. Christmas Day is just around the corner, and if there is one thing we are looking forward to, it's the food. Lots of it. But in doing so, we want you to take care. And if there are any regrets, it should be the extra pounds thereafter. Dangerous strains of bacteria such as E. coli and Salmonella can cause serious health problems when the food we eat become contaminated through improper handling and not being properly cooked. In light of the dangers, there are some important precautionary measures we must observe to protect our health. We have to make sure we know where we're purchasing our food. If it's straight from the farms, if it's from the market, it's from the supermarket, it's from the meat shop. Ensure that it is clean, when you are preparing the food, ensure that you have a separate cutting board for meats, separate cutting board for vegetables, and you're constantly washing your hands. If you're going to eat out, ensure that the environment in which you're going to take your family is one where you can trust that the food is being prepared in a clean environment. We love our street food, and we encourage, as Consumer Protection Agency, we encourage that e economic activity. But we're saying you are to take precautions as well, Ensure that your street food are from reputable persons that um, you know you can trust. Check the expiry date on food products before purchasing and check them again before cooking. In food preparation as well, the education is to ensure that you separate the raw from the cooked. You know, you know the raw and the cooked is a totally different um, environment. So when you mix the two, that's when you have contamination. That's when you have food poisoning. That's when you have a member of the family who might end up in the hospital because they're either very young or they're elderly or their immune system has been um, compromised. Discard any food that looks or smells questionable. Don't allow your food to stay open and accessible to flies. Containerize and refrigerate or freeze leftover food before two hours after cooking. And always store meats and seafood in sealed containers. The second thing about food safety is you have large amounts of food laid out. 
for a couple of hours or more and the family keeps coming back, dipping, visitors come in, dipping. You have to ensure if you have the food out for more than two hours, hot food, be very careful, especially if you add sauces and, and other, uh, other condiments on the food. It tends to go a little off early. And that is where you have problems if you have an elderly person or a young child. Make sure that you, you put that away early, that you don't put your family at risk. Because food poisoning, most of us get well quickly, but it can lead to death if your immune system has been compromised. So we're saying be, be safe with your food. Um, ensure that when you package them and put them away, they're packaged in portions where when you take them out to reheat, you don't reheat the entire thing and then put it back in the refrigerator. So you apportion it according to what you're going to be using so you don't um, increase the risk of uh, food poisoning or any other bacteria um, entering the food. Ensure meats are cooked thoroughly. Remember, improper food handling can mean the difference between a trip to the emergency room or enjoying a tasty meal. Two hundred and thirty-four Jamaicans have lost their lives in motor vehicle collisions in the first half of this year. Life is precious. Don't be a statistic. Drive with care. By now, I imagine that Christmas food preparations are well in swing. But just in case that is not so, or maybe you need some help to get things well in hand like Grandma used to, Chef Dennis Osborne has you covered. So we are making an half pound butter fruit cake today. So we're starting by creaming our butter and our sugar together. So we add half pound of butter in our mixing bowl and half pounds of sugar. We mix our cream our butter and sugar at uh, a medium until cream and fluffy. So we are combining dry ingredients first. So here we have a cup of flour, a of teaspoon of salt, two tablespoons of baking powder, Combine this together. Have half cups of breadcrumbs here. And the breadcrumbs is optional. So we set this aside. We move into our fruits, our dry fruits. So we have here some mixed peel. And we have some raisins. So it's half cup of raisin, half cups, half cups currants, half cup prune, and half cup cherry as well and quarter cup um, mixed peels. So we'll go ahead and put in some nutmeg also in. About a tablespoon of nutmeg because it's flavoring for us here in Jamaica. So this we combine all our dry ingredients so when we're mixing we don't have any separation by adding our dry fruits in our blender to get it puree and we're adding two cups of wine for moisture so it makes the cake all juicy and ready here we go our fruits 
it's all puree and ready to add to our batter in just a few. So we'll move over to our eggs. Here we'll be using seven eggs for our batter here. The first one is fine to crack in the bowl that you're going to whisk in, but for the others, preferable do them separate because of spoilage. All right, so we go by whisking our eggs. This helps to combine the yolk and also the egg white together. Here is our butter and sugar. It's cream and come to a nice peak. So this is what you need when you're baking your cake, light and fluffy. So we combine this butter, creaming portion to create our traditional fruit cake. Add in a teaspoon of almond and a teaspoon of vanilla and of course we'll be having just, a, just another pinch of salt and our Jamaican rum will be adding about say about two shots so we're gonna go ahead and put our cake butter inside the oven for 350 degrees for two hours, all right? to put on the glass just for decoration. So here we go, we have our fruit, Jamaican fruit cake. Also on the side, we're gonna serve some carrot cake. If you guys, for those who in the family doesn't enjoy the fruit cake, so we can have some carrot cake with some walnuts. We've come to the end of today's program, but we invite you to visit our website for a recap of this edition and other news coming out of the government. Until next time, I'm Adrian Atkinson saying stay safe and stay connected. This has been a production of the Jamaica Information Service, the voice of Jamaica.